Okay, the real beginnings of his prehistoric let's go revolves around this river, the River Clyde. It is thought to be inhabited many thousands of years into the BC. There are several tribes around here in Scotland, like the Picts and the Caledonians. Celtics came in and influenced things. All the way, in the, all the way far north. Look out, biker! Far north of Scotland and every area. But around here, there is archaeological evidence thousands of years into the BC along this river. It was an ideal place for a settlement because of abundant fish and fresh water access. So the first recorded record of Scotland ever was a Greek traveler in 325 BC who circumnavigated Britain and Ireland. Ireland. But not a lot is known until the Romans invaded. The Romans invaded and took over Britain to the south. 43 AD. This is when the tribes around here were first documented. The Picts means picture people. They, they had tattoos all over their bodies. And the Caledonians was another name that the Romans gave the people around here. And all of Scotland, really. They documented about 18 tribes total. Romans began pushing north past this region, up into the highlands even. Defeating tribes, building forts, 73 and 84 AD, There's some big forts in certain areas. But the Scottish tribes, the landscape, and the weather were too tough for the Romans to deal with. So further incursions far north were difficult, and the forts weren't man long. One crazy story is the Ninth Legion. It's one of Rome's best. Rome's best. Rome's best legions. They went up north again one time to fight these tribes in 108, around 108 or 120 AD. And they disappeared from record completely. No one heard about them from them ever again. It is thought that they could have been completely overrun and wiped out. No standard. So Roman legions used to have this gold standard. Nothing was ever found. No coins. There's a biker coming. No armor. Nothing. They just completely vanished. It's very strange because the Romans were very good record keepers and especially proud of this legion. And they just stopped writing about them. It's like they were embarrassed trying to cover up the loss. So as a response probably to this, a little bit later, Emperor Hadrian himself visited Britannia because all the problems happening in the, in the area. In the province of disarray. Constant revolt and problems. And it was his decision, the emperor in person that came around here in Scotland to fall back about 100 miles from here and build and garrison Hadrian's Wall, which is around northern England, Newcastle area. It was a the barrier for the civilized Roman British to the east near Newcastle to civilized Britannia to the south. Likely it was the constant attacks from the tribes and also instead of fighting each other the various tribes in Scotland started working together for the first time creating large fighting forces that overwhelmed the Romans at times who often had the Romans often had to focus on other areas all around Europe like Germania or even Judea in the Middle East Dacia in Romania and a bunch of civil wars happened in the Roman Empire so you know they they couldn't focus everything on this place. So they fell back to Adrian's Wall until 141 AD when another push north was decided upon to take try to take over Scotland again by Emperor Antoinon Pius. And a turf wall was built, which we're gonna go to the next, called Antonine's Wall, between the Firth of Forth and Edinburgh modern Edinburgh and the Firth of Clyde. Here's the Clyde. 
in Glasgow area. Let's head to the Antonine Wall. All right, so we talked about the native tribes up here, like the Caledonians. And around uh, the 100s AD, you ever take? Britannia, Roman Empire was getting established and taking over all those tribes down there. They steadily pushed north because the Scots up here were giving them the most trouble out of anybody. First, a little bit south of here, uh, about 100 miles, Hadrian's Wall was built, 122 AD, to separate the boundary of the empire, barbarians to the civilized world. But then they started pushing north. The emperor insisted on it, and by 142, Antonine got to up here and built Antonine's Wall. So it stretched about 37 miles from kind of near where Edinburgh is down here on that side of the island to the other side over here at the end of the Clyde River, the feared Clyde. So there are several forts stationed along the wall, and they're up here battling people. Uh, this was a bathhouse for the soldiers. They love their baths, especially in this, uh, right now it's kind of sunny, but it's been cold and rainy here, especially being out in the cold and rain and, you know, losing men and slaughtering people. And it must have been nice to have a nice little bath. We had the cold bath here, and the hot room and the dry room, and still here to this day. So this was built 142 AD at the order of Roman Emperor Constantine Pius. It took about 12 years to complete the whole wall I just talked about. Uh, the Emperor Pius never visited Britain like Hadrian did, who was all into making his wall. But the pressure from the Caledonians led, led Antoninus to send the empire's troops further north. Up here is the furthest north the Roman Empire ever went in the whole world, right to this spot. They, might have gone into the highlands a little bit on campaigns, but this was their fort and bases. The wall was protected by 16 forts and was facilitated at military sites along the whole stretch. This is one of the forts and the best remaining, uh, the best remaining ruins. The Caledonians, though, stayed strong. They battled the Romans, the Scottish, maybe stronger than anybody else. You had, you know, the Germanic tribes and some people in the east. Shout out, by the way, to the History of Rome podcast and the Britain History podcast that I'm both listening to at this moment, which is amazing to be here at the time I'm listening to it. I just, like, learned about this. It's incredible. So we're at the back house, and for decades they're fighting, they're fighting these tribes just trying to real get them into the empire. The Scots were savage, though. They just wouldn't wouldn't give up. Oh, this is the Roman legions were here fighting, also Bythonic tribes. But this was abandoned about 165. Ben, began to be a not abandoned, but by 165 A.D. Just. Not long after it was first built, it began to, uh, they began to fall back. This actual bathhouse was abandoned, I think 175 said over there. And uh, after a series of attacks, later on, because the Romans abandoned this wall, headed back south, 100 miles to the Hadrian's Wall, kind of near Newcastle, England, where that is. It stretches along the whole island of Britain also. They got, they left this area for about 30 years. So the tribes started getting stronger and they were pushing it down into the Roman areas, attacking more and more. So this was actually pretty interesting. The, the next emperor at the time, Septimius Servus, got really enraged by this. He wanted to re-go into Britain. So he actually uh, traveled to uh, traveled to Britannia with his sons, the co they're all co-emperors, and they went on a brutal campaign up into Scotland. 
genocide, actually. They would go into villages and kill men, women, children, leave them, just banish. And he wanted to come push all the way north, try to take over the whole island. They never were able to, though. But uh, in 208, to secure the frontier, and Servius repaired parts of the wall. So this was re, re garrisoned in that brutal, bloody campaign where all kinds of horrible things happened. But the Scots, the Caledonians, and other tribes, they stayed strong, man. They kept fighting. And the empire, the emperor actually died, I think, from sickness. Ah, or was he a set? No, I think it was his illness he, or old age. Just listen to this on the podcast. And his sons actually decided who hated each other by the way they both wanted to be emperor and, and, and their brothers and blood feud they decided to abandon the mission up here in Scotland took their genocidal legions and abandoned the wall again the reoccupation of the wall only lasted uh, a few years so the Antoinine wall that's along here UNESCO World Heritage Site right? the northernmost twice border of the Roman Empire a big part of Scottish history, especially ancient. Okay, so in the middle of Glasgow here, is, let's just talk about Scotland, the end of the Roman times. It's not really about Glasgow, it's modern Glasgow. So, after the retreat of the Antonine Wall, both times, to 10 AD was the last time, there was never an attempt to conquer north again by the Romans. There were some Roman offenses in the 300s, especially when there was some Roman Britannic Empire that tried to break off the Indian Empire a couple times, weird stuff like that, but we don't need to get into specifics. 397, the Scott tribes, you want to call that one, the coalition of tribes in modern day Scotland at that time pushed the Romans out from the Hadrian's Wall and led to its abandonment in the early 400s and uh, coupled with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, Britannia itself abandoned all the them. After this time, Gaelic, Gaelic, how do you say, uh, cheers? Um. Slavance. Slavance. Ba. No, Slavance. Slavance. They still speak it a little bit here. So Gaelic tribes that were coming over from Ireland began intermixing with the local peoples in Scotland, uh, especially in the northwest, a little bit north of here, establishing a kingdom called Dalratha. This is where the name Scots come from, the tribe called the Scotty. Gives the name to Scotland. They had real close ties with Ireland up there, so that's why they speak Gaelic in Ireland and Scotland. Um, there were some other kingdoms that popped up too, though. Like around here, in the mid 400s, there was a group of people called the Old North. A U D. A-U-D, it's a Gaelic Scot spelling. Old North. They were actually. Uh, Roman and Celtic influenced peoples and some Roman Britons that were left behind after the retreat of the leadership. You know, they were just locals living in the Roman Britannia. They started uh, coalescing and mixed with some of the Scottish tribes to create some kingdoms around 500 AD, collectively known as the Old North. They eventually merged and around here with the nearby Dumbarton Rock as its capital, down the river a little ways down there which maybe I'll show you they started a kingdom called Strathclyde in 547 AD which this area was a part of and it's around the time when Glasgow was established alright so this area what is now Glasgow was under the kingdom of Straight Strathclyde. Strathclyde. <laughs> Their castle in Dumbarton, down the, down the way a little bit. 
But let's get into Glasgow history now. I've been talking about a lot of Romans and everything. This is right here. Where the city of Glasgow started. Around 550 AD, a missionary named Saint Mungo now uh, built a church where a little community grew around right on this spot. Not this church though, this was built a little later. Get into that in a second. So around the 500 and 600s, especially with Christian missionaries, Celt Christian Celts, Christianized Celtics, and Gaelics from Ireland coming over, Scotland began to be Christianized from the pagan religions, which ruled it 4,000 years before, which were a real interesting mix of Druidism and nature worship, which I really like that kind of stuff. I wish more was known about that. but. Some cool shrine, shrines still exists around Scotland, all over the country, with these old pagan religions. I wish I could visit them, but mostly now, like this, we have Christian things, just like all of Europe. Anyway, so a noticeable difference, though, or initially was it was called Celtic Christianity. It was a little bit different than Roman Catholic. They had powerful abbots rather than bishops and more relaxed celibacy rules. Huh? <laughs> okay, so back to that. The Germanic Angles and Saxons, and there's a lot of people coming, let's move to the front. Germanic Angles, Angles, especially Angles were invading up here. And uh, Saxons lower down in England, they were coming over from areas like Denmark and where northern Germany is and Netherlands areas like that. They started pressing on the Strathclyde's kingdom. And other kingdoms in Wales and England. They started started they started them up. Like North Umbria and around here Bernicia around 547. But the Scots and different different Pictish and Gaelic kingdoms which merged into uh, Britain tribes. They remained independent from these people for the most part. Especially around here in western Scotland. Up until around the 800s. Alright, so from the 500s, 600s, 700s, 800s, Glasgow was a very small, small, small place. A little village. A small wooden church was right here. Probably little houses. The oldest house in the city is over here, likely maybe from that time. Right there, you know where it is? Okay. It's right there. <laughs> How's that? Cool. But let's cut to uh, Scotland as a whole. In the 800s, a powerful King MacAlpin was the first king of the Scots. He established Scotland in 843 AD. Uh, the first capital was a place called Scone. United all the different kingdoms, Strathclyde and there were some other ones to the north. And, you know, n the Norwegians and Vikings had some of the islands and owned them for centuries. The Vikings were invading, invading all over the island around this time, though. That really started back even in the 600s. But in the late 800s, the Norse Vikings really started taking over. They established the Kingdom of York south of here. Well, not, that's not what it was called. It's in present-day York. And uh, they even stormed Starthclydes, which the king, this is where was part of them. They even stormed Dumbarton Castle several times, including a really bad one in 870. We were there the other day. <laughs> anyway, the Scottish king kingdom was completely encircled as Vikings conquered nearly much of the island, especially most of Eng England and Wales. But up here, again, just like with the Romans, the Scots held out from being completely conquered. Uh, but Vikings did have permanent colonies, especially on islands and coasts all around Scotland for hundreds of years. That not a lot is known about, actually, until like the 1200s. More on Scotland history coming next. This is where the city started. At the cathedral. Alright, so it's right around this area. 
city city really start getting going. Uh, the Brigand. So I keep on getting bogged down in all of Scottish history, and not the city history. But what was happening in the region was really important to how Glasgow got started. And Glasgow really was a very small community centered around that church that we were at earlier. And Dumbarton was the capital of Starkleith. And uh, the area when it became Scotland, Kingdom of Scotland. But I'll keep adding in some overall Scottish history. Anyways, when the Viking leadership was pushed out, mostly to Ireland actually, no doubt some settlers intermingled. The Scandinavian DNA is probably in some Scottish here and there to this day. Around 900 was the origins of the Kingdom of Alba, which unified the island for the first time. So this is the starts of the Scottish Kingdom. It was called Alba. 834, eight, eight, mid-800s, this started happening. And Celtic Christianity with Catholicism. It was, a, it was a brand of Catholicism, but you know, not really aligned with the Pope. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And they had the backing of the English Kingdom of Wessex. So they had, you know, their able to keep their own thing going here, the Scottish. So, the 900s to 1200s is a little confusing with events. I won't go all into detail. But the important one is William the Conqueror. We all know him. Norman from France. Who was angered. Who took over England and all these areas south of here. Was angered by a Scottish alliance and attacks coming from the north. So they, they were attacking the Normans from Scotland. To, and he wanted the Scottish king to submit as a vassal. So the Anglo-Norman French lords started coming in to important positions as landowners starting to claim of Scotland to Eng parts of Eng Scotland to England. Uh, so this kind of started the way the church was set up, influence of Norman laws and different things. Scotland, though, remained independent as a whole, even though some of the people were Norman or lords and stuff like that. And they had all these royal marriages, alignments with other places. You know, that was the norm around this time. Lord, royal stuff and, and succession is all real confusing to me around this time. 1180 to 1190, though, Glasgow was recognized by the Scottish king, giving sitting a baron and an annual fair that took place. 1285, the first bridge was built over the River Clyde, right about here. Um, first ever bridge across the River Clyde, right here. 1260s, a powerful king of Norway, though, had some disagreements with the Scottish king and took over some lands of Western Scotland near here, which resulted in a loss by the Norwegians in the Battle of Largs near the Firth of Clyde, right down that way is the Firth of Clyde. 1286, Scottish royal succession issues almost caused civil war. Magnates had English King Edward I arbitrate to work out these issues. This backfired though, and the English king gained influence in Scotland and over his choice as king. And Robert the Bruce was angered, thinking that he should be king over the chosen successor. This all undermined the Scottish independence and the Scottish king went into alliance with France which got the English to invade in 1296 and depose the king of Scotland. With many battles going both ways, with William Wallace, Braveheart fame involved, leading armies, they, he de facto ruled Scotland at the time. But eventually he was captured and executed by the English in 1305. Actually down that way in Dumbarton is where he was captured. A lot of these battles were happening in the north up here by Stirling. We're getting a little off the topic of the city, but at the time the city was a small trading market town. Robert the Bruce, though, took over Scotland after several more battles and he took it over from the English completely. 1314, an independence and recognition from the Pope in 1320. And there were a few more attempts for English incursions in the 1340s, but Scotland remained independent as England 
became bogged down with France in the Hundred Years' War. Stuart, the line of kings that ruled Scotland, followed this time. Scone and then Edinburgh became the cap capitals around this time in the 1300s. So now I'll mostly focus on Glasgow history, city history. Right around here is where the docks their boats to these things who knows when these were built probably yeah I don't know 1800 maybe a little early but trade started becoming really big on the river here as a trading port specializing in shipping coal and herring 1600 Scotland was involved so trading was involved here all the way up into the 1600s the river University. So, in 1450, Glasgow was made a royal burke by the Scottish king, and in 1451, this university was built. Starting, uh, you know, the real cross of the city. This is the chapel area. This building, I think, was built a little later. Uh, but regardless, 1450 to 1600. Education, right? The university, right? And growth was happening in the city and in the country as a whole. Scotland, people educated, people literate. Uh, so these were universities in Scotland at the time, pretty old, 1451. So Protestantism came to Scotland also during this time, causing some religious shifts, mostly towards uh, Presbyterianism. Presbyterians started in Scotland. Um, different alliances with the royals and skirmishes were happening involving England and all their drama at the time. Uh, you know, France too. We don't need to get into specifics. You know, Henry VIII and Tudor. Weird stuff like that. But, uh, you know, Scottish had involvement. I'm sure the city was involved as well. Um, this all led, though, to 1603, King James of Scotland, he inherited the throne of, in the crown of England, also, which is uh, exactly how this happened. He must have had some claim to the throne. So he was the king of Scotland and England at the same time. The first time ever that uh, Scotland and England had the same king. And the first time they were merged ever. And he moved from, not here, he, the capital was Edinburgh at the time, to London. He was king of both England and Scotland. This is when Glasgow, after this union, 1603, really began to boom and grow. Um, Anglicanism, the Church of England, was attempted to work its way up here, but the Scottish resisted. There were some riots with that. This is uh, the chapel for the university. They have their own thing going on, the Church of Scotland. Anyways, more on the, uh, after 1600s, growth of the city, finally, from a small town. Next! All right, we're here at the River Clyde. And it's the big reason why Glasgow grew up. So, down there is a the central city. And shipping became huge. Out that way to the Irish Sea, the North Atlantic, connecting with, in the 1600s, the entire world and the beginning of globalization, the British Empire, and all that stuff. Well, we're getting ahead of us. So, in the 1600s, Scotland was involved in the English Civil Wars, kind of. The, take, you know, the takeover of parliamentary forces and the royal house was re-established in England after uh, Cromwell, all this stuff. This all kind of started with the uh, Scottish king. Uh, you know, I just, I said already, 1603, you began the king of Scotland and England at the same time. And his successor is all confusing royals. All right, back to, back to Glasgow. So there's a whole Glasgow and Scotland, even though they're beginning to trade, 1600s, 
they weren't part of the British Empire. Exactly. Still independent. They're mostly poor, mostly agricultural. Um, and they had ups and downs at the docks here. Different businesses. But, in 1707, the parliaments of Scotland and England decided to sign the Acts of Union. And this unified England and Scotland and sparked the economy of Glasgow and grew it to the city it is today, for sure. Which includes this river, River Clyde. It was the start of the United Kingdom, the Union Jack. Access to markets of the British Empire were official now. Trade to the Americas, the Caribbean, and the American colonies. Glasgow had benefited heavily from tobacco, sugar, and rum. Tobacco from what is now the United States, sugar and rum from plantations in the Caribbean. This started, and also starting around this time was the Scottish Enlightenment, with a lot of inventors, writers, and art, art writers and artists hailing from Glasgow. We were just at Glasgow University that started to become very esteemed in worldwide university. But, as always, there always is a spark of independence amongst the Scottish people that exists to this day. The Union, to me, has more, I feel, been economic more than cultural. The United Kingdom. But, it exists to this day. So, 745, the uh, city was occupied by insurgent Scots briefly, and they imposed some heavy taxes don't know exactly what was going on there but back to the Union Union United Kingdom fans they retook it over because they're making a lot of money man so this is when my country America disrupted Glasgow the tobacco trade which was Glasgow's biggest industry importing tobacco and distributing it all over the United Kingdom was disrupted in the 1770s, 1780s American Revolutionary War. So that was cut off. So they started uh, relying more on cotton and manufacturing. And those two things, especially cotton, was perfect for the Scottish damp climate. And they would ship it out from here. In 1795, this river was dredged began to be dredged in several canals going all over the place near us in Mary Hill a few going over there by the college different directions all kinds of shipping canals were built late 1700s and they connected that old coal and iron mines to Glasgow ports other products like scotch whiskey began to begin became popular in the early 1800s as well Ship from you know where, Glasgow. Uh, a lot of lowland distilleries relied on the port, like one built Akintoshin that I visited nearby. Well, started in 1823. And now we're here on this river that made the city and connected it to the sea and the port. And there's not a boat on it. It's very strange. But let's go to the modern Glasgow history. We're at the Clyde Arc here. Alright, let's get into modern Glasgow. As you can see here, this was all built up. Glasgow becoming the biggest city in Scotland. Second or third in the UK, I believe after London and Birmingham, maybe, or just London. All right, so as the Industrial Revolution spread up here and sped up productivity, the need for shipping coal in, happened. There were some coal fields nearby, so they used all this, that new canal system I talked about. <laughs> Different industries were popping up around Glasgow. 1829, the population surpassed Edinburgh as the largest city in Scotland. Um, and this area we're in right now is starting to be built up. 
potential city you came down there. But with growing populations come some problems though. The water supply that was pristine water for hundreds of years started to become polluted with industry runoff and uh, sewage, stuff like that. So a water piping system was built to bring in fresh water into the city and the people. But the city also had some notorious slums during these times, early to mid to late 1800s. A lot of crazy stuff was probably going down right here on these streets. A lot of poverty, rough times. The Irish uh, potato famine blight, not far from here in Ireland, I saw thousands of Irish moving to Glasgow, changing the population of the city, and they were often some of the poorest people. Uh, the main industry here, after the last industry was disrupted, was coal. That was disrupted, then came cotton. And again, that was disrupted by America. The Civil War in the 1860s saw a big hit to the coal, uh, cotton, excuse me, cotton industry. So then started some other industries like chemical production, manufacturing, and the biggest actually was shipbuilding. By the late 1800s, it was a one of the biggest shipbuilders in the world and a thriving United Kingdom city. It was known as the Second Empire, Glasgow, with half of good ship goods coming from the U from the UK coming here, and about a quarter of locomotive parts. Also, this boom had people moving from all over Scotland and other places into the city too. What we have here today, a lot of today's architecture and infrastructure was built at this time, late 1800s, early 1900s. Railroads, buildings, neighborhoods. Okay, let's wrap this up. World War I disrupted the economy and many, many, many Scottish soldiers actually perished in the battles of Western Europe. The interwar period saw some declines, but it picked back up around World War II. Some German bombers came into the city in 1941, targeting the shipbuilding industry, creating a lot of damage. More on the Clyde River down there. A road was disguised and as a river to thwart the bombers and they mistargeted a bunch of buildings, like a storehouse for a whiskey distillery I visited. After the war though, the industries started to decline and uh, sciences, universities became popular and now Glasgow, the tourist destination. Not as touristy as Edinburgh though still has that Scottish charm, a lot of locals still living here, and I had a great time here. 